The other day I had a question come in and it was, as I thought about it more, a great question. And someone had asked, you know, how do you deal with the continual perpetual dread that I feel? Uh, it's as if I'm just living with this blanket of dread, wondering when more disclosure is going to come, more information is going to come, another D-Day, if you will, is going to come. How do you deal with this overwhelming sense of dread? Uh, I'm trying to find this, you know, new normal and just kind of sit on the couch, watch TV, and hang out with my spouse. But this dread almost stalks her in the uh, question that she submitted. And I'll tell you, it's very normal. Early on, Samantha lived with an incredible amount of dread. And I don't have the time here, but early on, when disclosure had just happened, over the next two or three weeks, because I was a, uh, in the public eye, if you will, there was a lot of false accusation, a lot of rumors. She lived in a PTSD-like sense of dread and fear for a good month. It took about that long for everything to settle down. Dread can be defined as an intense apprehension or fear. It uh, refers to approaching something or even someone or a season, if you will, with incredible apprehension, fear, worry, stress, anxiety, and, and if there was a definition to describe what a lot of betrayed spouses feel or even what unfaithful spouses feel coming home to their spouse, it, it can be dread. But I want to focus today on the betrayed spouse because that's who asked the question and more than the unfaithful, I think the betrayed struggles with dread because you're surrounded by an apprehension to be vulnerable with your spouse because you don't want to be taken advantage of again and you don't want to be vulnerable with egg on your face because a whole bunch of new information comes out. It's one of the toughest scenarios to deal with. So early on, if you are just kind of launching out into recovery and you have this dread, maybe there's been multiple disclosures, maybe there's just been one, but you're overwhelmed with this dread. There's a few things that you can do. Number one is you've got to find community. Uh, and these aren't going to be in order of importance. I'm just kind of shifting on the fly to give you some thoughts. You've got to find a community. You've got to find a trusted same sex, maybe friend or two to support you that you can vent with, grieve with, talk with, yell with. Uh, you can find a couple of groups on the site. For the betrayed spouse, harboring hope is phenomenal. For the unfaithful, hope for healing is phenomenal. Those people standing with you and crying, yelling, weeping, praying, cussing, what, fussing, whatever, man, having that sense of community is irreplaceable. Another thing that you can do is you're going to have to really get the right help because the right help is going to help you navigate how to be vulnerable, when to be vulnerable, when not to be vulnerable, when you shouldn't be vulnerable because you would be inviting certain disaster back into your life and situation. I think it's important to note that there are times when you may need to even consult a professional about medication. Uh, early on, I had to get on some because I had just come out of some pretty significant thoughts of suicide. And although I had overcome them, the depression was really immense. And so I, I did some uh, anti-anxiety and, and a few things. It didn't work wonderfully, but I think it took a little bit of the edge off. And if at the, the very minimum it takes the edge off, I would tell you to consider it. Now, I know a lot of you are opposed to that. Hey, I get it. But you're going to have to maybe consult uh, or reference some breathing exercises. You're going to have to learn how to do some self-soothing exercises. Some people it's yoga. Some people it's prayer. Some people, there's a variety of things, but you're going to have to be able to have a place to shift your focus from the incredible amount of dread that you're dealing with to some other place. It might be working out. It may be going in the garage and breaking something. It may be getting a heavy bag and punching the crap out of it, but you've 
You've got to have a release and you've got to have a place to go. Because if you sit there and allow the dread to torment you, harass you, provoke you, and, and really steal from you, I think you are allowing yourself to be a victim, and I don't think that you really have to be. You may say, Samuel, my spouse is not safe. I'm constantly living in dread. I get it. In those cases, you may need to consider a separation if they are not safe, if they're not behaving in a safe manner. Accountability, openness, a desire to at least be amicable, a desire to be rational, a desire to get help. If they're not willing to do those things, you may have to resort to a separation so that you can have some peace in your own life as a betrayed spouse. Now, I want to shift gears and tell you a few things that Samantha expressed. For those that are further down the road, there hasn't been a new disclosure, uh, but you still are overwhelmed with a sense of dread. It's kind of like that picture that uh, you had submitted to me about you know sitting on the couch, watching TV, and really wanting to kind of let your guard down, but being afraid to because of this dread. So what Samantha learned, and I'll, I'll share this with you from a faith perspective first. Samantha said to me one day, she said, I have resolved to trust God with you. I found out the first time it happened. And if it happens again, I'm confident that I will find out and I will deal with it. But I can't live in dread. And I can't live fretting about what's coming my way. I'm going to trust God, and I'm going to walk this out slowly. If you're a Christian, that resonates with you because ultimately your trust cannot be in your spouse. Your trust has to be in the Lord and your confidence in God. Now, if you don't come from a faith perspective, your trust has to be in a few things that I would suggest. One is your recovery methods. If you're kind of duct taping it or jimmy rigging it, it's really hard to have a high level of trust and confidence. You want to get the best help possible. Number two is you want to have a confidence which is going to have to be repaired after the hell that you've been subjected to, but you're going to have to find a confidence to say, listen, I have, I have handled this now and I am handling it and I am strong and I am confident and I am able and I'll handle this again, but I'm not going to let the fear of what could happen rob me of the life that I am living right now. Another thing that Samantha trusted in was the process. I mean, we had an exceptional process eventually. Uh, the EMS weekend, seeing Rick periodically, a good strong mentor, uh, and then we worked our butt off because we were both open to it. I was more committed than she was. She was open to it, provided that I lived a safe lifestyle. And so you have to find the right process because if you're working the process, it helps you have confidence to know that you're doing what you should be doing so that you can let your guard down and not constantly be afraid of what's coming your way. Finally, for the betrayed spouse, I would tell you to be vulnerable progressively. As you feel it's okay to be vulnerable, be vulnerable. Be careful. Do it progressively and slowly. But do it confidently at peace with yourself to know, hey, I'm being pretty vulnerable and I'm okay with it. And then my, my last comment is specifically for you, the unfaithful. I learned this the hard way, and I probably should do a blog just on this, but I'll give you this one little snippet now. One of the most important things for you to be careful with is when your betrayed spouse is choosing to be vulnerable with you. It might be sexually, it might be just being intimate with you, talking, it might be sharing their heart and their emotions, when they are doing that, let me just tell you, you have the opportunity, as we say in sports, to be a hero or a zero. How you handle that vulnerability is one of the most important facets of your entire recovery. If you trample on that vulnerability, if you violate that vulnerability, you will not see that same vulnerability again for a while. So proceed with the greatest amount of caution that you can because that vulnerability is a gift. And how you handle that gift will decide whether or not there's more of that gift coming your way. Mm -hmm.